Our next speaker is um, Dr. Jeremy Cutsforth Gregory. Um, he, I think you'll enjoy his talk. He's going to be talking about the variabilities and vagaries in the clinical syndrome of SIH. Um, Dr. Cutsforth Gregory is an assistant professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic in Neurology. He's been quite active in the diagnosis and treatment of SIH patients, and the Spinal CSF League Foundation is also very happy that he, he sits on our medical advisory board. Welcome, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Connie and others, for inviting me to be here today. Can you hear me in the back? Just raise a hand. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm coming from Minnesota. Happy to be here where it's warmer take about 25 minutes today to talk about the clinical syndrome. So we've had a fantastic kind of theoretical background to CSF dynamics and perhaps the causes of pain here. Uh, I'm going to try to make this very clinically oriented uh, for the next talk. My hope is that by the end of the 25 minutes, you'll be able to describe the sh some of the shortcomings of the current diagnostic criteria for SIH, um, and then be able to diagnose SIH with common symptoms, but uh, also uncommon presentations. And finally, uh, discuss a bit about the non-SIH causes of orthostatic headache and other symptoms. I don't do this alone, though, so I want to start by acknowledging the great team that Bara Mokri uh, started to put together while he was still with us um, and who I've had the privilege of continuing to work with. Um, Dr. Garza is in the room, one of my neurology colleagues, uh, but we have also several surgeons who are important to this practice, a large and growing and uh, important team of neuroradiologists who do patches and diagnostic tests, and I just want to uh, acknowledge all of their efforts up front. Looking backwards a little bit before we look forwards, the first 100 years of what is now SIH uh, started with Quinky introducing the lumbar puncture in 1891, a few years later Beer describing post puncture headaches, and 40 years after that, Shelton Brand coining this term alicorrhea. Uh, which was the, his term for the clinical syndrome that accompanied very low CSF opening pressure. Uh, Waltman was a uh, former chair of our department who shortly after Schaldenbrand's report uh, described orthostatic headache in conjunction with spontaneous low CSF pressure and said, well, this looks a bit like, may resemble post puncture headache and yet in a patient who had not had that. So that kind of, I think, first leap into spontaneous intracranial hypotension. The MRI uh, reports then came, 1991, uh, the first kind of non-CSF biomarker for this disease. And as you all know, uh, things have just grown from there. So now looking uh, forward a bit, we recognize that we have several names for this disorder, spontaneous intracranial hypotension, also known, as I said, as alicorrhea. Um, we heard from Dr. Silberstein that perhaps volume plays a role, so CSF hypovolemia or CSF volume depletion have been coined. Uh, spontaneous spinal CSF leak highlighting where these leaks occur to give this syndrome, which is distinct from post puncture headache and also, of course, distinct from the skull base leaks that can present with rhinorrhea or otorrhea, uh, but typically not the orthostatic headache. And typically, these are going to be traumatic or represent a primary intracranial hypertension like IIH uh, as the underlying cause. So talking about the published diagnostic criteria, uh, of course, starting with an orthostatic headache, but then at least one of these other things. If you can demonstrate active CSF leakage, well, then you've diagnosed a leak. Not a lot of argument there. Um, if you can demonstrate low CSF opening pressure, same thing. And yet not every patient has low pressure. There are MRI abnormalities that are quite suggestive, perhaps even pathognomonic, the diffuse non-nodular pachymeningeal enhancement, and yet we don't see that in every patient. Uh, and then perhaps most controversial, sustained improvement after a blood patch, you know, of course, that brings in placebo effect or other disorders that might improve with blood patching. So uh, some of the critiques, I think, of these current criteria and the reason we have a, a guidelines writing committee to try to update these is because not every patient with SH has a headache. Not as pressure is not always low. In fact, more than half the time it's not. MRI is not always abnormal. And blood patching, you know, uh, placebo effect and other reasons to argue against it. So this is not a perfect, they're not perfect criteria. Uh, we can all recognize that. So it justifies then why we need to become more familiar with the common and uncommon clinical presentations um, that might lead us down this path. So let's talk about that. A uh, 40-year-old lady I saw not too long ago had no headache history until she did. She had a new daily persistent headache, 
that was a pressure in the frontal and occipital regions, worse when she was upright or with any Valsalva maneuver. And she also had other symptoms, orthostatic nausea and distorted hearing. Things always sounded muffled as if she was underwater. Um, her exam was normal except for some joint hypermobility. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Byton score. I'll show a uh, figure about how to calculate that later. But uh, focusing on this lady who had a new daily persistent headache with orthostatic and Valsalva worsening, it's a very classic presentation for SIH. And I suspect everyone in this room would put that uh, at or near the top of their differential and move ahead. Because uh, that's common, but it's not the only thing. You know, other common symptoms are neck or mid-back or low-back pain. Noting that the site of the pain does not predict the site of the leak. I think it's important for us to keep in mind as we say, should we do a focused myelogram just of their low back because that's where they hurt? Uh, I would say no because the leak could still be anywhere. Uh, nausea, vomiting, visual, and cochlear vestibular symptoms, all common. So perhaps not a lot of surprises here. Let's move uh, into the less common. Different patient, a 63-year-old man who, again, had no real headache history until he did. For 18 months, he would get a headache essentially every time he coughed or sneezed or laughed or bent forward, and never at other times. He said the headaches, when he would do one of these triggers, would spike and then gradually fade over 20 or 30 minutes. It's a very predictable pattern, uh, except that if he was upright, it didn't matter. If he was flat, it didn't matter. If he coughed, he would get a headache. If he sneezed, he'd get a headache. Um, neuro exam was normal. So this story would give you a diagnosis of primary cough headache, and right? he fits the criteria, um, and yet primary cough headache, even in the uh, International Classification of Headache Disorders, comes with a notation that perhaps 40% of the time, primary cough headache is actually symptomatic of an underlying disorder. Uh, so important to keep in mind, even what can be called primary is not always primary. And here's the man's MRI. Uh, you see he has no brain sag, but he clearly has diffuse pachymeningeal gadolinium enhancement. Uh, perhaps thin, but it's there. Um, and highlighting that SIH was the likely cause of his cough headache. And I'll skip kind of the steps that came next, but ultimately he went for a digital subtraction myelogram. And I've given you both the uh, original image, fluoroscopic image, and the subtracted image. And the subtraction really brings out uh, the fact that he has this little left T10 CSF venous fistula. Uh, I should orient you, by the way. These pictures would be 90 degrees rotated. Patient's head's at the top of the screen, but really they're performing the lateral decubitus position. Um, and you can see the nerve roots coming off, and there he had this fistula. So he was quite happy to go for surgical ligation of that nerve root and became headache-free. Uh, so we have to be mindful, I think, of a Valsalva headache or primary cough headache uh, can be cured as long as we think about what some of the other causes might be. It's not always going to be leak, but sometimes it is. I will show examples of a couple of these uncommon presentations, but I've put the summary table here up front just to make sure we uh, see a nice unified list. So headache is not always orthostatic, and the bottom line is it can probably be almost any pattern and still represent a leak. Um, I showed you the cough headache patient. There are cognitive changes uh, in many patients, and perhaps from the lack of the glymphatic uh, removal of the waste. But there's also the very characteristic behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia syndrome that comes with uh, dementia-level cognitive impairment. Um, as you know, the pituitary gland will grow and shrink corresponding with the pressure in the head. One of the uh, volume compensa compensatory patterns, loose CSF, bloody structures have to get bigger. Uh, pituitary is one of those. But that can lead to a variety of endocrinopathies. Dr. Mokri uh, described a handful of different movement disorders in these patients. And then, of course, the leakage is in the spine. And sometimes those fast leaks give you that long extradural fluid collection. And that can either compress the cord or stretch the nerve roots. And we can get a variety of uh, spinal cord dysfunctions, including a segmental amyotrophy that looks like ALS. Right, so there are a lot of different presentations of what we lump together as spontaneous intracranial hypotension. So just a couple of other examples of those uncommon presentations. Um, this is a 53-year-old engineer who I saw uh, not too long ago who had lost his job because he'd become disinhibited, lost empathy, perseverative. He really couldn't do his job, even though his memory was perfect. Um, but it, it fit that BVFTD phenotype. MRI was abnormal. You can see quite severe brain sag here, along with the enlarged pituitary, the optic chiasm draped over it, flat pons, 
there's really no recognizable midbrain. It's kind of all swollen up here in the diencephalic region. And that is perhaps the uh, one, of, if not the only, I think, strong correlation between what does the MRI look like in these patients and what syndrome do they have. All of these BVFTD-like patients will have the brain sag, and they tend to have a swelling up here in the midbrain diencephalon region. These patients also tend to be hypersomnolent, and not just the fatigue I lay in bed, right? That's common, but these are the actual sleeping 20 hours a day, 22 hours a day, um, probably from the same reasons. There's diencephalic uh, distortion here uh, affecting the arousal pathways. This man happened to have a fistula T7, so a root that could be ligated. It was. And his brain stem isn't perfect, but it's certainly looking better than it had. His midbrain became recognizable. He's got an aqueduct again. And he was uh, clinically normal over the course of about six months. It wasn't immediate. It took some time, but he's doing quite well. And then one other uh, clinical syndrome or radiographic syndrome that can be associated with uh, CSF leaks. So the timeline that I've just thrown up here already hints at a very long process for this patient. Um, I met him at 52, but in taking a history that just seemed to keep going back farther and farther and farther in time, at age 11, he'd been in a bike crash and had a concussion and been stuck in the hospital for six weeks, not because he was unconscious, but because any time he tried to sit or stand, he had a severe orthostatic headache. And the cause wasn't really recognized then, and treatment was just stay in bed for, in the hospital for six weeks. Again, that was 40 years ago. And as we moved ahead with his life story, you know, in the 20s and 30s, he'd been diagnosed with migraines, although when asked, he said they clearly would be worse with Valsalva maneuvers um, and probably could have hit a cough headache uh, diagnosis then. Changed a little bit in his 40s where he couldn't lie flat because he would get a headache that was worsening, so a paradoxical pattern. And he also started to have hearing loss. By his early 50s, he had that second half of the day phenotype, right? Woke up feeling okay, but by the afternoon would have a headache and ataxia, hearing loss and ataxia, uh, chronically progressive, sounds like siderosis. MRI scan shows exactly that. So here's an axial uh, SWE. You see all the hemosiderin deposited in the cerebellar folia uh, as well as elsewhere. And with or without the story of the orthostatic headaches at the start, siderosis now should trigger at least a consideration of a spinal fluid leak with the dural rent probably being the source of microscopic but chronic uh, bleeding. Niresh Kumar has done a good job of uh, kind of establishing that association, I think. And in this patient, uh, his MRI showed this longitudinally extensive. We will uh, watch it on the TV, I guess. I'm going to rely on the people in the back to fix that. You can still actually see his spine kind of over there. So he's got uh, large fluid collection. The dura is just visible. Down here on the axial, clearly an extradural pocket of fluid. Dynamic CT myelogram. Um, the terminology here is a little different, um, what we call dynamic, what um, other institutions call dynamic. But basically, patients prone in the CT gantry, butt up, head down, uh, spinal needle in place, as dye is injected and running downhill, then images are obtained. It's a good way for finding fast ventral leaks, and he had one of those at C67, uh, operatively repaired. And while there's really no way yet to get rid of the siderosis, his headaches improved. Uh, and his fluid collection is shrinking. Thank you very much. Yay. All right. So I talked about a bunch of common and uncommon clinical syndromes. There are also radiographic presentations that might not immediately trigger us to think of spontaneous intracranial hypotension, um, among which would be the subdural hematomas or hygromas without a history of trauma, perhaps a non-elderly patient, uh, or recurrent. Important to recognize leak as the underlying cause because it'll probably keep recurring until the leak is treated. Um, I'll show a picture of what we've come to call layer cake skull, thickening of the skull in the setting of uh, probably chronic intracranial hypotension, and then stretching of the venous sinuses and other mechanisms likely can, tr can contribute to a spontaneous uh, leak complicated by a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. And we've recently had several patients uh, with leak, thrombosis, and a known complication of thrombosis, a dural AV fistula. Uh, so all these things, I think, when you see an intracranial dural AV fistula, um, perhaps not commonly going to be from leak, but we should think about that. So other ways to recognize this uh, syndrome. Here's that cranial hyperostosis. Um, 
I think we can think about this in terms of the Monroe Kelly hypothesis that we just heard from, again from Dr. Silberstein. Remember, rigid container, brain, blood, spinal fluid, lose one of them, one of the other things has to change. Well, it turns out maybe you don't grow more brain and you don't always, you can only compensate so far with additional fluid collections. If you lose the outward force on the skull, the bone will continue to grow, but it doesn't make your head bigger, it just grows in, make the container smaller. And so in a uh, little more than 300 leak patients, we saw this pattern in about 40, so 13%, so a minority for sure. But when it happened, usually it was this kind of dual layer. It gave you this layered appearance to the inner and outer tables of the skull. And uh, we thought it looked a bit like a cake. You know, food analogies are always good. So layer cake skull might be a way to recognize intracranial hypotension. And lastly, um, what about when patient had a leak, we're pretty sure it's fixed, and yet they still have some symptoms. Or symptoms might be a leak, but evaluation never finds one. What else could they have? Because as I say, you're allowed to have fleas and ticks, right? You can have two different diagnoses. Um, orthostatic hypotension is one of those. So the definition would be a sustained reduction in blood pressure, um, defined either by systolic or diastolic criteria, occurring within three minutes of standing or head up tilt. Um, here's what that would look like on a tilt table study. So I'm showing you the tilt. Uh, the patient is flat during the white portion, upright during the gray portion, and then tilted back flat again. Green line is heart rate, and then you've got your systolic, your mean, and your diastolic blood pressures. Major uh, message here is that normally tilting up doesn't change blood pressure much, and heart rate might go up by 10 or 15 points. But in a patient with orthostatic hypotension, especially if it's neurogenic in origin, blood pressure drops, heart rate doesn't really do much until the patient, until you basically subtract gravity again from the situation, tilt them back flat, blood pressure recovers. So how does that, or why would that overlap with some symptoms? Well, here's the common symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion. Uh, there's lightheadedness, tiredness. We've talked about visual symptoms from SIH, muffled hearing symptoms, and headache. Although the pattern here is usually just a little bit different. There's this coat hanger pain. Patients will say they've got a tightness in the neck and shoulders as if they're being hung by a coat hanger. And it's an important thing to recognize is probably a pressure issue uh, and less often exactly a CSF issue there, although it's possible. So overlapping uh, disorder. Another overlapping autonomic disorder is postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS. The definition here is a combination of an excessive heart rate rise upon standing and symptoms either of the cerebral hypoperfusion like we just talked about or of kind of sympathetic activation, right? So palpitation, th things that come from too much adrenaline. Uh, and so this combination uh, is not rare, keeping in mind the definition that the heart rate cutoff of 30 beats per minute is actually 40 beats per minute in younger people, because it can be normal to have that much heart rate acceleration. Um, show you a picture. You saw this one, the orthostatic hypotension. Here's what a POTS tilt study might look like. Relatively stable blood pressure, despite that heart rate goes up and up and up and just keeps climbing, and symptoms that are consistent with orthostatic intolerance. So you can just more things to keep in mind when gravity makes someone not feel well, right? We saw the blue list already, variety of symptoms related to sympathetic activation, palpitations, shaky hands, sweaty palms, headache, and in a variety of series of patients with POTS, migraine was reported in anywhere from half to almost all of them. Sometimes orthostatic, often not, and so if I see someone who clearly has POTS but also has a strictly orthostatic headache, I'm going to think about POTS plus or POTS with a leak. So it's not that you have to have only one of these things, but we should keep in mind these other ones because treatments are different. A couple clues uh, that someone might have POTS um, would be the fact that neuro exam is normal, but their radial pulse softens when they stand. It's a flak sign is the name of that. Um, you can get cold blue hands and feet from the vasomotor instability uh, as well. And then I mentioned the bite and hypermobility score earlier. Very uh, easy, quick way to gauge someone's degree of basically flexibility. You know, can you touch the thumbs down to the forearms? Do the pinkies go past back beyond 90? Do elbows hyperextend beyond 10 degrees? Same thing for knees. And can you touch palms flat to the floor without bending your legs? Five points out of the nine is hypermobility syndrome. That used to be equivalent to hypermobile EDS, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. That's not the case anymore. It's just joint hypermobility syndrome, and there are additional criteria for EDS. Um, relevant, it's a risk factor for POTS. It's also a risk factor for leaks. Uh, 
So, but I think it's useful to gauge that in every patient. It doesn't cost anything. And a um, couple of interesting papers from the last uh, couple of years. First one showing that the symptoms of POTS overlap considerably with the symptoms of leak. So this was a series with a relatively small number of leak patients, nine, a uh, larger number of POTS patients, 48. Everyone had a tilt study and uh, met criteria for POTS. And you can see how common some symptoms were in each category. So orthostatic headache uh, was in every one of these leak patients, a uh, decent number of POTS, nausea, syncope, palpitations was one thing that seemed to discriminate, although um, I think with larger numbers we'd see that probably all these numbers tend to go up a bit. While the symptoms might overlap, the mechanisms are not the same. And that's what the second paper got at. Used uh, ultrasound of the optic nerve and the optic nerve sheath to show that in POTS patients, the optic nerve sheath diameter was the same whether they were supine or standing. So they had symptoms, but optic nerve sheath didn't collapse. But in leak patients, optic nerve sheath collapsed, shrunk when they stood, which makes sense. You don't have enough CSF, stand up, the, you're going to have a little collapse. Maybe a non-invasive way to distinguish these diagnoses. So it's uh, not in wide clinical practice yet, but uh, it's not a particularly advanced technique. I think it's something that we could uh, start to implement more and more, and hopefully will. And so wrapping up here with just other causes, again, of orthostatic headache that aren't due to leak, there are other headache disorders, cervicogenic headache. If holding up the weight of your head on an arthritic neck, uh, if that's what you're doing all day long, it's going to hurt. That's uh, either bony lesions or even soft tissues in the neck. You can get a headache that gets worse over the course of the day, cervicogenic. A blood patch is not going to help that. There's usually going to be neck pain in conjunction with that as a clue. Vestibular migraine has all the common migraine features, but also has a vertigo or lightheadedness or a dizziness that comes with position or with head motion or with vision changes. So th there are some other things where they don't overlap completely, but just enough that we need to have these on our radar as we um, try to help patients. And finally, 3PD, or persistent postural perceptual dizziness. It's a chronic dizzy disorder. Waxing and waning dizziness, unsteadiness, usually a non-spinning type of vertigo. It's worse with being upright. That's the reason it often gets confused with POTS or, pots or leak. Uh, but also motion of the person or motion of the environment, complexity of the visual environment. So uh, you know, at Mayo, we have these subways, which is basically a tunnel to walk underground so we don't have to be out in the cold winter quite so often. But it has this carpet that has this awful design that repeats and repeats, and it, it makes our three BD patients totally dizzy. So it's a nice way to ask, how'd you do when you walked through the subway to get your appointment today? Oh, it was so awful. And once I got out into the lobby, I was fine. OK, there's a big clue to the diagnosis. Um, 3PD is usually triggered by something else that affects the vestibular system or causes uh, a postural event. So someone has syncope or has POTS or has leak, that get, even if it gets corrected, some patients are predisposed to have ongoing dizzy-type symptoms. And so uh, keep in mind, you can have SIH and then go on to 3PD. Treatment's different, and that's the point in making the diagnosis, right? We can help these patients too, but it's with different techniques. So with that, uh, I will just remind you, hopefully, of what you learned. We talked about the shortcomings of the diagnostic criteria. We talked about common symptoms of SIH, uncommon presentations, both clinical and radiologic, and some of the non-SIH causes of orthostatic headache. We will do questions later. So for now, I'll just thank you for your attention. Thank you.